The prelude today is uh, the promised land. This is a time for meditation. So. <laughs> Okay, the call to worship, um, if you will rise, and I will read. If we're on the same page, join in. If not, then I'll read. Okay. We rejoice to be in your presence this day. We praise you that your presence has settled within us. Your spirit, your presence brings us your guidance. Transformation. Your spirit calls us into a community of caring so that our lives might be enriched. Your spirit directs us to the care for our world so that others may know and experience your love. If you could turn to page four in the black hymnal.
seated. Okay, our invocation, <clears throat> excuse me. God of grace, we come to offer the worship of our hearts and minds. We offer to you our praise, for you have made us your own. We offer thanks to you because of your constant gifts of creation and redemption in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Accept our worship this day. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, amen. And the hymn of meditation is... 414 in the black hymnal. <laughs> If you would join me in the confession. God of grace, thank you for your great love for us. You have provided for us salvation. So we come before you with deep thanks. In spite of your love, we confess that we often disobey. We so often forget his sacrifice. Forgive us, Lord and empower us to be your faithful followers. Through Jesus we pray, amen.
responsive reading is from Psalm 111. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. And the epistle is from 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact, there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This ends the epistle. If you would rise for the hallelujah. <clears throat> hallelujah. standing for the gospel. <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. 
They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This ends the reading. may be seated. <laughs> ah, amazing. Ah, scary. Anyway, I wanted to 
Thank you, Jane, again. And I want to apologize for the secretary's messing up of everything. I'm going to have a solid talk with him. Uh, he doesn't listen well, but uh, that's what you put up with, is volunteer help. Uh, well, anyway, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, what an interesting way to start the record of Jesus' ministry the confrontation with a demon-possessed man. Now, that would be nothing unusual in that world. And the world probably up to the 15th, 16th century, when people still believed in those things. But with the Enlightenment, quote-unquote, and all of that, there's come attack on all aspects of what is supernatural, what is beyond us. And so it's... It's, it's just really interesting. You feel that when you look at a passage like this, you have to explain this whole thing about demoniacs, people who are possessed of demons. And I confess I can't. I look around and I see and read of people who are so surpass. They are totally, totally incapable so it appears, of even thinking of what is good, let alone doing it, and are caught in such, such a horrendous life. I think of the, uh, you know, in light of this passage, the demon-possessed men known as Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong, and we could count of a lot of others who, in their place of authority, killed probably 140 million people between them, among them. And you think, how could any human being do that? I'm almost inclined, and am inclined, to believe in the role of, of the evil one, of the demonic, in situations like this and probably in a few others. But at the, I want to say at the beginning, whatever we look at, we have to understand that we have been addressed by the word and we are told, greater is he than that is in you than he who is in the world. And I think that when we become upset <laughs> with the news, for example, and all of its positiveness. <clears throat> and sometimes we can think, and I sometimes I think, it, you know, it's just kind of going downhill, a slippery slope. I always want to say to myself, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, as Billy Graham once said, you know, I've read the whole Bible, I even read the book of Revelation, and guess what? We win. I mean, that's, that's a bit facile, but at the same time, it's, it's a reality in which we can rejoice. Always. But as we first get to the narrative, Jesus, the, Mark first focuses on the authority of Jesus' teaching. I think it has to do not only with the content of his teaching, but with the manner of his teaching. Uh, Mark, as is recorded in Matthew after the Sermon on the Mount, there is this sense that the people are amazed at his teaching because he teaches like no one else. There is something going on with him that the people listen to and they know he is different. And part of that is because what they hear in their normal teaching is the teaching of a scribe. Of Jesus, well, he himself would say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. 
He doesn't quote a list of 10 rabbis who affirm a particular position on this passage of scripture. He just simply says, you have heard that it was said, and I say to you, the authority is here. The authority is with me. And besides, he goes on to say, like in the Gospel of John several times, I teach what the Father tells me to. His authority is not a derived authority. It's an authority that comes directly from the Father. And so that when we listen to his moral teaching, when we listen to his teaching on any matter, we can be pretty well, adjud pretty well judge that what is being said to us comes from God. In the prophets, we have that word, Alwyn, always, the prophet is always saying, and the word of the Lord came to me. But with Jesus, you, you just have him say, I speak what God tells me. And so that sense of authority, without appealing again to others for what he is saying, the validity of what he's saying, is really different. It would be like going to, a, <laughs> for me, be like going to a Society of Biblical Literature meeting and listening to papers. And all the papers there are lined with footnotes. You know, unlike our poor Harvard president who plagiarized, that is, you know, that is definitely not to be done within that society. And they catch you. <laughs> In fact, my, my granddaughter had an interesting experience at the school where she's at. She took this course last term, and because of the, and it really was, it was her negligence, but it was really the un, uh, unfailing, uh, what do I want to say, uh, wrong, I think, of the professor who would not accept one paper late. And so she funked her, and she had to take the course over this, you know, this term. <laughs> and uh, so, she, you know, it's the same paperwork and same coursework, so she turned it into her first paper. She got it back. This is, this is about 75% plagiarized. <laughs> they have the pattern of scanning all the papers that are turned in and compared. And she went to talk to them about it. And she said, well, this is self-plagiarism. <laughs> what? But anyway, so she wrote the paper again without understanding that self-plagiarism was a sin as well as plagiarism. Of course, I often say the difference between plagiarism and scholarship is plagiarism, you use one source. Scholarship, you use two or more. Uh, it's different. And you footnote it, of course. But what the people of a synagogue would be listening to would be a presentation by a rabbi. At least this is what I have gathered from what I've read. He would present, make a position, and he would say, this position is supported by Rabbi so-and-so, and this position is supported by Rabbi so-and-so. And I could imagine the sermons, quote-unquote, could be very long, as they quote from people from whom they have learned certain aspects of understanding. And Jesus, you just have him say, and I say to you. And of course, you have some people saying, I'm sure, who does he think he is? And you have some people saying, this man teaches with authority. He's worth listening to. For the congregation of the synagogue in Capernaum, their astonishment at the authority of Jesus' teaching was soon accompanied with a different kind of authority. Not only did he have an authority in the teaching, but there was an authority in his word that when spoken effected that which it intended to be said, that which it intended to be seen. So this guy appears and he's uh, possessed of a demon 
And he says, what does he say? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And the people responded, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. It's occurrences like that that help me understand why John would call Jesus the Word of God. Jesus is the Word because when he speaks, what he wants to happen, happens. Remember Genesis starts off? In the beginning was the word, etc. And God spoke, and it was so. God initiated everything with his word spoken. And that would lead, it seems to me, any reflecting man like John, and the Spirit, of course. Jesus, too, is the word because of what he's able to affect when he speaks. The casting out of the demon in the synagogue is the first recorded exorcism in Mark's gospel, although Jesus had already encountered Satan in the wilderness. As you read Mark, there'll be eight more occasions, I remember, where Jesus is encountering demoniacs and frees them. The fact that Jesus encounters unclean spirits throughout Israel during his ministry whatever we make of them, and especially even in synagogues, was a sign that the land itself and even its religious life was under the oppressive influence of Satan. So we look at our country or world, we see the ready influence of evil in one form or another. I mean, all you have to do is reflect upon what happened when the Hamas invaded Israel what they did to men, women, children, babies. Just like ISIS had been doing two years ago throughout Iraq and into Syria. No compunction. People who did not belong to that sect, who would not yield to them, were mercilessly murdered and buried in mass graves all across Iraq. And you know, you think... How can anyone do that? I mean, my influence, my th thinking is, because they're not under the influence of God. It's like Tom Stevenson used to say. There's a person with, there's a person there behind that, and he has horns. How could? How could, how could that go on unless the evil one was present? The belief in and fear of the demons was constant in the society of the Near East, Israel included. Obviously, Jesus' exorcism ministry demonstrated divine power over the forces of evil and in cleansing the synagogue of its demonic presence he was calling Israel to accept him and to return to God. He was signaling that in his coming kingdom, there will not be the hint of the demonic, for they will be eliminated in the end. Dr. Paul Turnier says of this matter, doubtless there are many doctors who in their struggle against disease have had, like me, the feeling that they were confronted, not something passive, but a clever and resourceful enemy. Or another, Dr. Rendell Short wrote, the happenings in this world, in fact, and its moral disasters, its wars and wickedness, its physical catastrophes, and its sicknesses, 
may be part of a great warfare due to the interplay of forces such as we see in the book of Job, the malice of the devil on one hand and the restraints imposed by God on the other. Interesting observations. In spite of modern man's opposition to this thinking, the modern world has an amazing fascination with evil and demons. Outside the Christian community, there's a tremendous interest in the demonic. It seems that the dominant genre at this time seems to be horror and witchcraft. Hollywood has discovered that our primordial fears are fertile ground for grinding out one gory horror movie after another. Interest in the occult and witchcraft is probably more widespread in Western society than at any time since the 1800s. And I am told there are more self-proclaimed witches today in Paris, France, than there are Roman Catholic priests. Since that is traditionally a Roman Catholic stronghold, such a statistic is rather disturbing. Some people would say that the resurgence of interest in the, interest in the occult is a sign of our society's hungry for the supernatural. I don't think so. To look at the encounter between Jesus and the man is instructive. The unclean spirit's statement, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. As one, of, one observes, the have you come probably corresponds to the I have come, which is used of heavenly beings and approaching human beings. The, the in, implication is in some sort of heavenly preexistence of Jesus that is being recognized. The sense is strengthened by the us of the statement. The demon does not seem to be referring to the persons in the synagogue, but to the demons with whom he is allied. If this is the case, then have you come does not na relate narrowly to the coming to the synagogue, but to his coming into the world. And the reference to Jesus as the Holy One of God would seem to give great support to such a thought. The people of the synagogue do not understand. The informed Christian reader at this point in time and Jesus himself recognize a fleeting glimpse of his deeper identity that the unclean spirit gives us before Jesus silences him. This is a skirmish in Jesus' activity which by intention will overcome death and Satan in the last day. This whole message of conquest under Jesus is climaxed in Jesus' death and resurrection itself. We know what Jesus was after. He was signaling to the world, caught up with belief in the demonic, that he was and is greater. Even again, as John reminds us, the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus speaks with an authority astonishing either, even for a prophet, but under the full authorization of the Father. The result of Jesus coming to us is liberation and awe. The authoritative word of Jesus is a word that offers a course to the directionless, and hope to the despairing. It also itself creates an appropriate fear, for we see what it can do, and therefore is awesome. If we retreat from the authority of Christ's word, its liberating power will not be conveyed or experienced, nor will we display the appropriate fear which it should inspire in us. However, if we embrace his word for ourselves and declare Christ's authority to the world, 
his word can begin to be known and bring change. Like the man in the synagogue, he has freed us. Let us speak his word of freedom. And remembering again, as I have said before, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. No matter what. Amen. Four fifty one, our hymn of meditation. time of joys and concerns uh, I want to announce one joy and that is there is a men's breakfast this Saturday at 8 o'clock a.m. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, there will be a service for Ann Walker on February 10th that's a Saturday, I believe, at 1 o'clock here. And the family is uh, bringing up some things for the reception. So uh, they just ask, ask me to put on some coffee. So we'll have that. Yes, ma'am. met some 15 years ago by a group of women who got together and decided to <coughs> put their, their sticks all in one basket and, and try to get something done. So the Oracle Women's Network went and worked very, very hard to create the Oracle Visitor Center. 
it is a Department of Transportation um, facility, which really puts us more on the map. Unfortunately, after all of these years, not enough help popped up, and the Oracle Women's Network and the Oracle Visitor Center have had to shut down. So it is a resource that we don't have anymore. I hope you all have been there at some point in your life. Um, and um, I hope something else comes forward. I hope that some people who are moving into town, or new people or old people, uh, want to be a community rather just than a house to live in and go someplace else for your community. I know I say this with a great deal of passion, and I feel that it's something that, that we've really lost. The community center we still have for now. We have Monday, first Monday lunch tomorrow at 12. Um, I hope people will come. The Saddlebrook Rotary has stepped up and been a great contributor to the success that the community center has seen recently. But the board, which is some overlap with the visitor center, um, needs always new people. We always need new volunteers. Oracle can't be a community without people crossing over and and seeing these things that happen in Oracle as positive. Recently, recently we've been <coughs> able to start an after school band program in San Manuel at the school for fourth through eighth graders. This is because people believe in Oracle and because we were able to get a grant, the Oracle Piano Society was able to get a grant for, the, for education. We were able to pay somebody to teach to do repairs. That's enough, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my cousin Ron went through his surgery, but they couldn't complete it because his blood was too thin, so he'll have to continue the surgery. Yeah, Diana. I would like prayers for my daughter-in-law, Heidi Creighton, who just lost her job because her division was closed by the international corporation she worked for in Los Angeles. And working in the corporate world is not easy. So I pray that she can find another position that will satisfy her use her talents. But pray for this family, please. Okay. Yes. Um, we went to see Betty Van Winkle yesterday and so prayers for her. She's awfully weak. Um, her foot's still being they just don't quite know what's wrong with her. <coughs> Going to the doctor this week, but she's very frail. Yes. Betty. Yeah, thankfully she's singing, seeing uh, a Dr. Goshima, who has been her favorite person for many years now, and hope, hopefully Dr. Goshima will be able to find out what's happening. Yeah. Hi, Barbara. for over two weeks already and her sister-in-law is has Alzheimer's but she's in a very combative stage of that disease and so um, she's been up there trying to take care of both so prayers for her and the family yes Cynthia already started and are continuing to start our facility testing journey. Um, 
um, we already had some things done. Um, we have little bits of information here and there, but over the next several weeks and months, we expect we'll have more concrete information on how we are able to move forward. And so we just really appreciate all your prayers. Mark. Douglas. Uh, already mentioned about Oracle and uh, leadership and what have you. And good friends of mine, Mary and David Harris. David had to undergo surgery on Friday, Thursday, for increasing the spacing between vertebrae in his back. No. He's doing pretty good, but he needs your prayers. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hard to start, but I have another. We are, I'd like prayers for our granddaughter, Deanna, who is in her first trimester. Mm -hmm. She hoped and prayed for this for a long time. And we're very happy for them. So pray for, pray for getting through the first trimester successfully and going on to the second baby. Cool. Others this morning. Well, let's be praying. We are so grateful, great God, for your call to us <clears throat> that we can assemble together and offer you our worship and praise. So thankful that You've worked in our lives and the lives of so many of our friends who are in worship as well. We pray always for your continued guidance upon us and may we come before you ever with a search of wisdom and a sense of awe and a sense of gratitude for your good work in our midst. We thank you that you have answered so many prayers in behalf of others and ask for your continued blessing. We pray for Ron and this delay that the surgery will be completed and he'll be on the road to health. Pray for Heidi. She will find a good position. We pray for our dear friend Betty, who is... Um, undergoing such problems. We ask for your healing grace. We ask that her visitation with the doctor this week will go well. We pray for Barbara's friend Nancy. Give her strength as she struggles to help her brother and sister-in-law. And we pray for Kat. And we pray for Mark's uncle, Bring them healing. And thankful that Mark's uncle prepare, has prepared his life for you. Pray for David. Back surgeries are always so difficult and ask for your healing grace. And we pray for Brianna, for your strength upon her, that as she bears a child, the child will be strong and Brianna as well. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for your grace and direct our lives to honor you. We pray for peace and wisdom to overwhelm the leaders of this land and we pray for your church worldwide that it may undergo always your, your care and your support and your strength. And now, Lord, we would share together the prayer Jesus taught us 
and we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. As we prepare for communion, the hymn number is 330. great joy is that our God has shown mercy on us, and we celebrate that here. Mercy obtained through Jesus Christ, who has brought us his salvation and his hope. We remember the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. Take and eat. And after the meal, he took a cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. Drink you all of it. And so let us pray. The God of grace and mercy, thank you for your appointing this place for us to meet with you for this meal to partake in remembrance of your great love and our Savior's great gift of himself. Bless this bread to the strengthening of our lives, to the fruit of the vine, to the renewal of covenant with you. We're accepting your cleansing in your life. Bless each one that partakes. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
Let us partake of this spiritual manna. We partake of the blood of Christ. closing song in the red hymnal number 641 first verse we can stand
end up with just my messing up a little bit like I started, right? <laughs> Makes a perfect day. Well, we have some great goodies fixed next door. Great goodies. So be sure and come over and uh, enjoy the fellowship. Let's pray. God of grace, thank you for your mercy. And we pray that your spirit will guide us in this week to come, directing us, correcting us, assisting us. And may the love of our Lord Jesus ever inspire us as we live our days before you. May we bring you glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen.